good to be back with family and be in the house. And I know you all just got settled, but I'm going to have you all stand up. Power in the name of Jesus. Some of you have used a lot of names this week. But if I was to challenge you to think how many times you've called on the name of Jesus, maybe you're going to find that actually it's less than it should have been. Maybe you've called other people before you called on the name of Jesus. He's the first place that we should call because it's his wisdom that we need for every area and aspect of our life. And today we are in his presence on purpose, for purpose. And God wants to help you. He wants to nudge you to live a life that reflects more of who he is and whose you are. And today I want to talk about a part of your life that will require maybe some changes. Part of your life that has great potential, but so often we don't maximize the potential in this area because we are way too casual. And so I'm just asking us just in this moment to give God permission to do what he needs to do. That whether it is an adjustment or a change, that we would be willing for God to make that and help us make that. So God, we thank you today. That you love us so much. That you want to help us live our life to its fullness. God, you are not a God of limitation. You're a God of the expansive, of the immeasurable, of the more. And God, I pray today that in this area that I believe you're wanting to help us, God, I pray we begin to believe and see that God, there is more, there is expansive. There are new places for us to walk and new journeys for us to embrace. God, I pray today that I will get out of the way so that you can have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may take your seats. So I know, church, that as a community, the word that Pastor Randy and the team have placed over this year is calling, living called. And I love that that's an emphasis at the beginning of this year for you to focus on. And I really believe that because my heart is knitted to the team here and to the house here, that that my part today is to add another layer to that, another aspect to living a life that is called. And I want to touch on one of the greatest areas where you can see your calling explode or your calling shrink. One of the greatest areas where God can place an anointing that exponentially increases your calling or you can place something in the way of your calling in this very same area. Today, I want to talk to you about your relationships. Everybody say, ouch. (laughs) You know, when it comes to our relational life, oftentimes we underestimate the impact and the influence it actually has on our calling. We live in a world that has become so casual about relationships. We have so many people that have fake friends instead of real friends. Hello. 
We think that people are our community, but actually they're not our community. They're just people that are at the other side of a screen or someone we watch on Facebook. And the truth is they don't really know you and you don't really know them. And yet we settle at that level of relationship in our life when the God has purpose that all of us would have a divine called set of relationships that He has called us into for something way bigger than ourselves. And I think it's time for us to go back to our relational world and ask, where is my relational life missing the calling of God? Where is it time for me to put my calling and the things that God has called me to do at the forefront of the companionship that I choose for my life? How intentional are you about your relational life? How casual are you about the people that you hang with or the people that you associate with? How deliberate are you about something that will affect and change your destiny? For where we are casual, the enemy will take territory. Where we are accidental relationally, he will make sure we don't get in alignment for what God has called us to our eternal assignment. Relationships are so important when it comes to the aspect of your calling. And today... I want you to see your relational world through an elevated lens. I want you to commit afresh to relationships on purpose, for purpose. This is not a time for the church to be playing fast and loose with our relational life. This is a time for us to be so focused on who we should be with, on where we should be, on what we should be attached to, because God is asking us and looking to us to build His church in this hour on the earth. God is very, very clear about how important our relational world is. He's so clear that He sent His only Son to sacrifice His life so He could have a relationship with you. Not so He could have religion with you or an acquaintance with you, but so that He could have a relationship with you. Some of you need to start right there because actually you don't have a relationship with God. You you have a religion. You call God, God, but you don't know Him as your father, as your friend, as your companion, as the comforter and the lover of your soul, as the one who wants to be deeply involved in every aspect of your life, not just on a Sunday for a couple of hours. That's not a relationship. Stop giving God visiting hours to your life and instead invite Him to give your life a visitation which will change everything. He places such a high value on relationships that when Jesus was challenged in Matthew 22 verse 37 about the most important commandments for people to live by, they both revolved around relationships. He said it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. That's your relationship with Him is the very reason why we are called and why we must live in that place of union with Him. And then secondly, He said the second commandment is that you've got to love others as you love yourselves, that there's this relationship with others that is a crucial part of your calling and your destiny. You cannot do life alone. I know you might think that it's easier and sometimes it is. I know you might think you can go faster on your own and sometimes you can. But if you want to truly live out the call of God on your life, I'm telling you, God has wired it that two are better than one. God has wired it that we would work together. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 tells us the power of our working together. We have a better return for our labor. We can protect one another. We can lift one another up if one falls down that God has wired you and I to do life relationally. So how are you doing in your relational callings? Does your life look like the clicking and unclicking, the following and unfollowing? Are you highly connected but barely committed? Do you know a lot of people but you don't really know people? Are you attending or are you aligning your life? These are questions we must ask ourselves. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and you'll become wise. 
For a companion of fools suffers harm. It's not difficult, people. (laughs) You want to be wise? Stop hanging out with the fools. Like, Like it's not rocket science. You want to grow in wisdom? You want to mature? Then stop hanging out in foolish conversations, in foolish relationships where no one is speaking wisdom or truth because nobody really wants to hear wisdom or truth. Stop hanging in a companionship of fools if you want to build a life that has a call and a calling about it. The Bible is very clear in Proverbs 12 verse 26. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully, not casually. Not accidentally, carefully. And if you today were to do, as it were, a check on your life, if you were to think of your relational life like a bank account, I want to ask you, how healthy is your checking account? Some of you are overdrawn. That's because you let everybody make relational withdrawals and you don't have enough people making deposits. Some of you are over-invested relationally because you spread yourself so thinly that you don't anymore have a deposit left that's gaining interest in your life and for your future. We need to look at our lives and ask ourselves, am I aligning my life in a way that like Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, the iron is sharpening iron? Or is there an area in your life where you're blunt? Is there an area where you're like, man, I feel like there's a bluntness in my life. Well, my question to you is what iron can you add? What relationship can you commit to that causes you to have that iron in your life? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 35 says, don't be misled by bad company because it corrupts good character. And I could go on and on and on and we will be here all week and into the week after with scripture after scripture that tells us as God's people the level of importance that relationships hold. And in a series on calling and living called, we cannot ignore the power of relationships to either propel you into your calling or actually repel you from your calling. And so I want to take us to a book in the Bible just for the time that I have that's all about relationships. In fact, this book is called The Book of Companionship. Some of you are like, wait a minute, she has an extra book in her Bible. I do not have that book. Yes, you do, because the name Ruth means companion. The name Ruth means friendship. So when you turn to the book of Ruth, you're actually turning to the book of companionship. You're turning to a book that's all about relationship and friendship. And in this book, we find the story play out of the difference it makes to attach your life to the right people versus the wrong people. And I want to encourage you today because the beginning of this story, it's not good. Relationally, there's been a lot of loss and maybe you find yourself today in a place where you feel, man, people have betrayed me or they have hurt me or they have left me. Maybe you find yourself in here and you're divorced or you've had a breakup in one of your relationships and you just didn't see it coming and it's left you feeling that you can't trust anyone or you feel isolated. Well, the book of Ruth, it begins with a lot of loss relationally. Naomi has lost her husband. She's lost both her sons. She has no relationships that she used to rely on to rely on anymore. And yet we find at the end of the book of Ruth in a few short chapters, how the journey begins to change so that now her life is so relationally rich that at the end of her life, not only does she have family, not only does she have people surrounding her, but actually she ends up in the genealogy of Jesus. How do you go from loss to legacy? The right relationships. How do you go from broken to restored? The right relationships. How do you go from feeling like you're lost to feeling like you're found? Relationships. God is using our relational life to propel us into the purposes for our life. In Amos 3 verse 3, there's this little verse 
And it's so little you could miss it, but it's so crucial that you don't miss it because it just says this, this statement. It says, do two people walk hand in hand if they aren't going to the same place? It seems an obvious statement, but it's asking a question. It's saying, before you put your hand in someone's hand, there should be some questions you ask. Question number one, where are we going? You want to live a life that's called? You better make sure before you put your hand in that person's hand, you know where they're going because where they're going, if you put your hand in their hand, guess what? That's where you're going too. That's why some of you right now are in relational crisis because you're in the spot and you're in a situation that's causing you so much tension and you're like, how did I get here? I'll tell you how you got here. You put your hand in the hand of that business partner. You put your hand in your hand of that acquaintance and you fail to ask the question, where are we going? What do you believe about generosity? What do you believe about legacy? What do you believe about the church? What do you believe about actually honor and respect? What do you believe about accountability you forgot to ask questions or you asked what golf course are you a part of what do you like to do on a weekend what's your favorite sports team we ask all the wrong questions and then we put our hand in the hand of someone because we have shared interests not realizing all the while that we're walking in this directing you're getting further and further and further away from your calling and that's why I said at the beginning of the message today, today God may ask you, he may prompt you to make some decisions or undo some decisions because you are called to live a life on purpose, for purpose. And so sometimes you have to take your hand out of the wrong hand so you can put your hand in the right hand. That's why the Bible says don't be unequally yoked. We might not like it, but it's in the Bible. Take it up with God. He knows what he's doing. Some of you chasing all kinds of relationships in all the wrong places. Whereas if you just follow purpose and calling, you'd find exactly who it was and who it is that God has assigned to your destiny. So in the book of Ruth, that begins with such loss. We find Naomi making a very brave statement. She stands there and she's about to let the two that are left in her life, Oprah and Ruth, she's about to let them know, hey, this is what the deal is and this is where I'm going because she's not about to drag the two daughter-in-laws into the future. She doesn't want to be the one that pulls them reluctantly to place where she's going. She's creating a moment of decision. And we all need to have those moments of decision. Some of you are dragging people. Literally, some of you dragged someone to church today. And while I commend you for dragging them, if they're over the age of 20, it's time to stop dragging them and start speaking to them and saying, listen, what are you doing with your life? I can't keep dragging you to Jesus. You've got to start deciding what is the purpose of your life and your future. What is the calling of your life and your future? And Naomi makes a bold statement. She says, listen to both of these girls. I'm going and you shouldn't come with me. So in verse 8, she says, go back, each of you, to your mother's homes. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And in verse 11, she says, go, why would you come with me? I'm not going to have any more sons, even if I got a husband. And tonight I had children, you still wouldn't be able to have a husband through me. So go, don't wait. She's releasing them. And in that moment of release, there are two responses. It says that Oprah is tearful. She kisses Naomi on the head and she says, I'm out of here. But it says that Ruth does something so special, so called, because there was nothing in this that was beneficial for Ruth. 
There was nothing about what Naomi just said that would make her be attracted to the future where Naomi was heading. The only thing that can cause you to say the words that she's about to say is that you understand there's something about your calling that's connected to the calling in this other person. And you're not about to let that go, even though right now it might be inconvenient, even though right now it might be uncomfortable. And so Ruth says these words to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you. I'll turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized, I can't shake this chick. When Naomi realized this is not based on what I have or what I can do for you. This is coming from something within you that's attached to something within me. This is coming from a purpose. This is not coming from a personality. This is not coming from a benefits package. This is coming from a calling, attached to a calling. I'm telling you, it is time for Ruth's to find Naomi's. It is time for Elisha's to find Elijah's. It's time for Aaron's to find hers. It's time for Joshua's to find Moses's. God is asking us in this moment of time to allow our lives to collide with the people that He needs them to collide with for a purpose that's beyond convenience or personality, but something inside you is connected to something inside them. And you just say words that actually don't make any sense to a world that's looking for an exchange, but words that say, I don't get it, but where you go, I go. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. I am called and committed to relationally work something out with you. I'm old enough to have grown up where there was that covenant language spoken way more than it is now. Language that committed, language that said, I'm in and I'm all in. Language that said to someone, I got you and I'm following the God with you and I'm gonna build the kingdom alongside you. And while we live in a world where it's like, I'm in if it's good and I'm out if it's not. I'll follow if I feel it and I'll unfollow when I don't feel it. If there's something in it for me, then I'm all in. If there's not anything in it for me, then I'm all out. And I wonder how we are going to ever achieve what God has called us to achieve here on earth. If our relational world looks just like the world's. I imagine how Naomi must have felt in that moment. I imagine what those words must have done like steel to her soul. As Ruth says, you can't shake me. I'm going nowhere. I'm called to serve God alongside you. I'm called to follow the same God that you follow. And if we don't allow purpose to be the center of our relationships, then we will find that when problems come, our relationships will crumble. When difficulties arise, we will unlatch our hands from the people that God asked us to latch to. It's only purpose that can hold you in the midst of a problem. And right now there's a lot of shaking going on and you better understand who you are attached to and who you are assigned to and why there is a purpose in the middle of that relationship. And if there's purpose in it, you better use words that cling to it and hold Hold on to it because the enemy is hell bent on breaking up the relationships that he knows this purpose in. He does not want our relationship world to thrive. From the very beginning, he's attacked every relationship there was from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel to, to Jacob and Esau to Joseph and his brothers to David and his brothers. Read your Bible. Every time there's the potential for calling to explode through people, the enemy gets in the middle and tries to separate what God called to unite. Church, can we open our eyes and stop treating something so casually that God has put so much importance and weight on? 
You know, I um, watch a lot of interior shows and I was doing a remodel at my home not so long ago. And when the builder came in, I said to the builder, hey, I I want this whole space open plan. I want you to take down every single wall. And the builder looked at me and he smiled and he said, that won't be possible. You actually do need some walls. I was like, but on those interior shows, they have no walls. Like it's all open plan. Just get rid of them all. He's like, I get rid of all the walls. You will have no ceilings. It's like there's something you need to understand. Some of the walls are aesthetic, but some of the walls are load-bearing. You can't remove a load-bearing wall because it's carrying the weight that others are pretending to carry, but it's actually holding up what others are pretending to hold up. And I believe purpose and problems come together because the problems begin to reveal to you who's a load-bearing wall and who's an aesthetic wall who's in this for purpose and who's in this for convenience. And in a shaking season, like we've all just been through, some of your relationships have been shook. And you've been shocked what has happened when the shaking has taken place. And some of you have been disappointed that the relationships that you thought would always be there are no longer there. But I thank God for every shaking because every shaking is revealing of what walls are actually load bearing. You cannot build on a wall that won't bear weight. You cannot. You cannot establish the kingdom of God and relationships that don't want the weight that comes with it and the responsibility that comes with it. And when Oprah kissed and said goodbye, she's like, peace out, I see trouble ahead. And Ruth's like, I'm peacing in, I see trouble ahead and I'm a load bearing friend, I got you. And as Naomi changed her name, think about it. She changed the name. The Bible says that she was called Naomi, but when she enters back into her old town and the women say, here's Naomi, she says, don't call me Naomi. I'm no longer called Naomi. In verse 20, she says, "Ah, my name is Mara, which means bitter. (laughs) Everybody wants to be your friend when you call Naomi. You know what Naomi means? It means pleasant. Everybody wants to be your friend when you're pleasant. But she changes her name to Mara, which means bitter. And now you really do find who are your purpose sent, God sent friends. Because the friends that love you just as much when you're Mara as they did when you're Naomi, they're the friends that God's going to use to establish something through. That's not about you and it's not about them. It's about something far greater than either of you. And God is looking for us to build our life where we actually can hold fast in seasons of testing and hold fast in seasons of advancing, that our relational worlds are load-bearing walls, that our relational worlds are just like Daniel's who had friends who had to go with him and actually face the king and actually risk their own life, just like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who were like, well, we were friends before, but in the fire, we're really friends. We need friends that are not scared of the fire, nor friends that are scared of the places where our purpose may put us. You need a friend that in the prison cell says, what chorus are we singing? Let's get going. Those are the kind of friends that are able to bear the weight. And I'm asking you today, are your friendships based on personality? Based on what you have or what they have? Or your friendships based on calling? Are you highly connected but not highly committed? Problems will shift you. Purpose will shift you. And I firmly believe that we are living in a time where we need to wake up to why God has aligned us and why God has placed us in certain places and why God has certain people in our world. I remember not so long ago that God threw my life together with a girl that was from Nashville. And it was pretty miraculous the way that we ended up being friends and we became very good friends and became best friends and began to go on vacation together. And I lived in England, she lived in Nashville and we both went through infertility and shared all that together and we were just great friends. 
And I remember one day I was in England and I felt God tell me off. You know, it's not good when God is about to tell you off. And I felt God say, Shala, I did not go to all of that trouble to bring you from England and this girl from Nashville so that you could just have vacations together. It's not about you. And I called my friend up, called Natalie that lived in Nashville. And I said, Nat, I think we're in trouble. And she said, you know what? God's been speaking to me too. And I said, I just feel like we've been going on vacations and as good as it is, we've missed the purpose. My friend Nat, she's a pretty good singer. Second name, Grant. And so I called her and I said, Nat, you're good at singing and I'm pretty good at talking and Maybe God's just telling us that this relationship has a purpose that's bigger than either of us. And we began to travel and minister together. And I'll never forget the first night that we had an altar call at the first event. And the altars were flooded with people that were coming to find Jesus. And tears were running down people's faces. And you could see lives being restored and marriages being put to, back together. And as I'm standing at one end of the platform, I catch her eye at the other. And she's crying and I'm crying. And in that moment, we suddenly realized man, God, you had a whole plan. You had a whole purpose. You had a whole calling in bringing us together and we almost missed it. And I'm here to say to some of you, don't miss it. God has drawn you to some people. God is asking you to cling to some people. God is showing you some areas where you need, like Ruth, to attach yourself to a Naomi. And it's not about vacations and it's not convenient and it doesn't even make sense. But there's something in it that is bigger than both of you. There's something about it that is kingdom building and kingdom advancing. And we are right now in a stage and in a place in history where we get to be the Ruth and Naomi's of our day. And I'm asking you, is your relational world a reflection of your calling or is it a reflection of your comfort? One thing I've realized is that proximity relationally increases intimacy and intimacy increases fertility. Be careful. Wrong proximity, wrong intimacy, wrong fertility. You wonder why you keep producing Ishmaels? When God's looking for the Isaac? You wonder why you keep producing a deal, but it's not quite the deal. You wonder why you keep producing an opportunity, but it's not quite the opportunity. You wonder why you keep investing, but it's not quite the investment. Be careful because over here at the beginning of who you put your hand in the hand of, you're beginning to align yourself. And in the alignment, you're beginning to choose your assignment. And in the intimacy, you're beginning to increase the fertility and what is in them is getting on you. And what is on you is getting on them. And if you're not careful, you will produce the wrong thing where God wanted you to produce the right thing. That's why this is so crucial. You can't fulfill your calling with the wrong relationships. God wants us to get aligned with the right people. And in this relationship that begins with loss, where Naomi's like, I have nothing to offer. Ruth says, it's not about what you offer. It's about what's in you. She can't shake her off and so they begin to journey, overcoming the problems of having nothing and Ruth stands up and says, I'm gonna go work in a field because that's what load-bearing friends do. I'm gonna provide what you can't provide and I'm gonna resource what you can't resource because that's what load-bearing friends do and as she resources and she provides, Naomi leads and Naomi guides. And isn't it amazing when we have relationships that are based in purpose and calling, how we end up in fields owned by someone called Boaz. Boaz became the redeemer 
of this story. Boaz became the person that stepped in and increased the potential of both those women's future. God assigned Boaz to the field that Ruth was in. But check this out. When Ruth inquires why she's found so much favor, Boaz says these words, I heard about your relationship with Naomi. See, everybody wants a Boaz. But Boaz came because of the relationship with Naomi. Everybody wants the Boaz. Everyone wants the favor. Everyone wants the relationship. But don't you realize that it was the choice back here which felt really painful and really a lot of loss that Ruth made, that put her in a connection with Naomi, that put her in a field that was owned by Boaz, that put her in a place where she was proposed to and marries this man. And now Ruth marries Boaz. And becomes pregnant with a baby that was called Obed. Obed that ended up in the genealogy of Jesus. And when Obed was born, it says the whole village shouted, Naomi's had a son. Well, Naomi didn't have a son. Ruth had a son. But what Ruth produced became part of Naomi's legacy. What Ruth carried became part of Naomi's story because when you find called relationships, they become a legacy relationship that far outlive what you could have done on your own. And now generations are secured because of a choice that was made back here by two women to decide to put calling ahead of convenience, purpose ahead of personality. Today, this message has huge consequences for all of us. You want to get on board with your calling? You better check your circle. You want to produce the Obed and the legacy? You better look whose field you're in. You want to see the kingdom built? You better ask whose hand have I put my hand in? All across the room today, I'm asking you the question, is your relational life a reflection of your calling? And if not, what are you going to do about it? What choice are you going to make? What conversation are you going to have? Some of you need to stop being on the outskirts of God's family and put yourself in. Some of you need to stop playing with your destiny and start attaching to someone who will align you to the purposes of God that are in you. All across the house, I'm gonna ask us to stand to our feet. Time's gone. Let me just settle something for every one of you. You are called. (laughs) This calling's not for a few. You're all called, you're all chosen. The difference between those that fully fulfill their calling and those that partially fulfill their calling is how deliberate and how committed are we going to be to make the decisions that need to be made to put us in the fields that God has asked us to be in. Just close your eyes all across the room. I don't know where this finds you today. Some of you relationally feel lost. And God wants to move you into a place of legacy. Some of you put your hand in the wrong hand and God today wants you to be willing to take that relationship, lay it at the altar. Some of you are producing a lot of Ishmael's. It's time to stop and trust God for the Isaacs. So all across the house today, God, I pray for every single one. I pray for every leader, every Naomi to find the Ruth. I pray for every Ruth to find the language that is necessary. And I pray for every Boaz to appear in the field of favor that you've assigned them to. God, we don't want to produce something that brings us honor. We don't want to create something that brings us fame. God, we want to be carriers of legacy, birth 
the old beds of the future. God, we want our lives to count for something more, and we know we can't do that alone. So God, I pray today for relational adjustments and alignments, for conversations that are centered on the purpose. I thank you for every Ofra that traveled thus far, but God, we're looking now for the Ruths, the Naomi's, the Joshua's, the Caleb's, the Elijah's, the Elisha's. And his eyes are closed all across the room. I'm asking one last question. Where is your relationship at with God? Maybe you've run from him or maybe you are religious, but you have no relationship. Until you put that right, all the other relationships won't be right. Until you understand the power of your relationship with Him, you can't find the purpose in any other. And so today, if you are not in relationship with God, if He's not your Father, if He's not your Lord, or you are running from Him, I, I'm urging you to run towards Him. Some of you, your life is a relational disaster. And the only way to fix it is by you first knowing that you are first loved by the One who's planned every relationship that you will ever need for your future. And so today, if you need Jesus, I just simply want you to lift your hand where you're at and say, I gotta get God in that spot again. I gotta get my relationship with Him right again. I gotta run towards Him and not from Him again. And as you've lifted your hand, just put it on your heart. God, I thank you for the honesty in the rooms today. I thank you for what this decision represents. God, I thank you today for salvation and forgiveness. I thank you today for relational restoration. I thank you today, God, that as they come to you, you fully accept and receive and love them. And today I pray that purpose would be born on the inside of them. Today I pray that as you wipe their past clean, that God, they would step into a future and run into the fields of favor you've already planned for their life. God, we thank you that you are a restorative God and you are a relational God. Thank you for salvation and restoration today. We give you all the glory and all the honor in your name. Amen.